Talk and Rock Radio. Where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome, everyone, to Talk and Rock Radio. You know, when I look back at the many artists that I've interviewed over the last three years or so, most of them, well, they have a specialty, you know, like usually singing or playing their favorite instrument they grew up with. My guest today is an anomaly. He sings, he plays sax, flute, keyboards, harmonica, and percussion. And he plays them all really well. His story begins in Fort Worth, Texas, where he was born and began playing music with his brothers in the early 70s. Welcome from Los Angeles, California, the amazing Warren Ham. How you doing, buddy? Good. It's, it's great to be here. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for well, having me. Thank you, Warren, for agreeing to come on. You know, before we dive into this thing very deep, I, I first want to give a, a big shout out to our mutual friend, Robbie Robinson, for making this happen, man. He... Uh, He's really a good guy, and uh, he's the yes, one he that is. told me to to hook up with you. So we're uh, here. We are, you know. Yeah, Robbie's a great guy. Known him for years. First question I'm going to ask you before we really get into the history of what all you've been doing and everything is: How did you learn all these instruments and to get as proficient as you are with them? Well, I've always been interested in a lot of different things, you know, uh, not just in music, but in life in general. But uh, musically speaking, I started out as, as a singer singing gospel music with my folks when I was just a kid, you know, 
And then when I got into high school, I, I got into uh, rock bands and such and blues bands in the uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. And uh, I took up the harmonica at 15 and thought I wanted to just be a blues harmonica singer guy, you know. And uh, then uh, Jethro Tull came along and I had to start playing the flute. So, <laughs> so I started playing the flute and that worked that worked into pretty good into the, the local bands that I was playing with around uh, that time. And uh, then uh, a couple of three years later, I, I realized that uh, flute being in the woodwind family was akin to the saxophones. And I was starting to get interested in the saxophones as well. And since the fingering was uh, very similar, especially in the first two octaves, uh, I decided to give it a try. So I, I got myself an alto sax and began messing around with that when I was with blood rock in the early, very early seventies, just, just out of high school. I think I had done a year of, uh, maybe a semester of college, junior college at that point. And then, so you, that's how I started playing saxophone. And then the others just came. I mean, I studied a little bit of piano because I was taking music theory and such in, in college. And uh, flute was my major and piano was a second. So that kind of came, you know, with it, the Bach inventions and so on and so forth. So I, I learned enough about piano to, to help me with the theory of all of it and everything and then percussion and all that rest just kind of came naturally later on you know as sort of a filler kind of a thing now do you ever play a, br a drum kit or are you you just doing per percussion congas and things or no i'm just a, basically a hand drummer you know hand percussionist i don't really i play tra tambourine and and shakers as well but uh i don't really play kit okay Interesting. Well, and, and a lot of that studying, I mean, did it start early, like in grade school, high school or? Yeah, like I said, I started harmonica at 15 and just self-taught. And then when I took up the flute, that was largely self-taught until I got into college. And then I began to, to realize that I needed to maybe learn to read music if I wanted to expand my vocabulary, you know, and learn some, you know, flute sonatas and and stuff so that I could, you know, broaden my uh, musical sensibilities in that regard, you know. So I learned enough to, about reading and stuff, and I was in the jazz band and so on and so forth with a tenor sax, and that they lent to me. Uh, I had at that point jettisoned the alto sax and started playing soprano sax, right. and didn't get another alto sax until about ten years later. Well, and you were as a harmonica player, you were actually, you know, looking at the right at the right groups, man. Paul Butterfield Blues Band. I mean, doesn't get much Absolutely. better than that as far as cutting your teeth on it, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. The um your history is is amazing, Warren. I I want to have you kind of dive into this chronologically because you've got a lot of famous artists that you've worked with and I think it'd be kind of cool to just start out you know you can talk about blood rock and and where it went from there for you and and and, and the transition of how it happened and, and uh yeah I'd like to hear some of the cool stories with these artists too as you go well blood rock was a was uh they were a local band as well you know so I, as I said before I'd played with a lot of local bands in the Dallas Fort Worth area and they were a local band out of Fort Worth and they had hit it big with a with their single DOA, which you might remember, which is about a guy who was killed in a plane crash and was describing it, you know, uh, his death, which was anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was my uh, audition for that. When their singer quit, they had a singer named Jim Rutledge and he quit the band for some reason. I'm not sure why. Then um, they did the auditions. They auditioned me and and they finally settled on me to, to be his replacement. And I ended up working with them for about three or four years. We did a couple of records at Capitol. And it was my first uh, experience coming out to California at that point and play, uh, playing at Capitol Records. And, of course, I see Capitol Records every time I drive down the 101 in Hollywood now. So, anyway... That was a that was sort of a harbinger of things to come. <laughs> I have great memories of that when we were living out in Newport Beach uh, with my with my bands out there. We uh, 
we were going to the Dick Groves Music Workshops, and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah, we we were all studying with some of the greats out there, Tommy Tedesco and Lee Rittenauer, and you know, and and of course I was enjoying all the all the great drummers, Louis Belson and Paul Humphreys and all these great guys. But uh, great, great, great times, man. Great memories. As far as the your first big breakout group that you worked with. Is that going to be, would that be Donna Summer or would that be Kansas? Who would that be? Well, I like I said, I had my first record deal with uh, Blood Rock at that point. And uh, then after that, after the label dropped us and we we broke up um, in, let's see, uh, 73 maybe, something like that. Then <clears throat> I went back to college. I came back to Texas. Well, I was still in Texas and I went... I went back to school and my brother and I formed a band that w- uh, in the North Texas area called the Ham Brothers. And he was a guitarist and it's, it still plays a little bit. And we played all around the Texas area and uh, did open for a lot of people. Like uh, we opened for Weather Report once we opened for Leon Russell and we did a lot of recording in the Houston area and Austin and so on and so forth. So we we kind of did the Texas circuit for a while. And then I was still trying to do college on the side part of the time. And uh, eventually, um, toward the late 70s, uh, we were, we played a lot, uh, a lot of clubs. We were playing at a club called The Hop on Berry Street in Fort Worth. And uh, Dean Parks, who was a big session guy here in L.A., or as it turned out later was had been working with uh, David Gates and bread. And uh, they came into the club to see us play. And subsequently David hired us for his next tour, both my brother and myself. And we ended up uh, on that did, did just the one tour with, with uh, uh, David at that point. But my, my brother had previously worked uh, with Dean and David Hungate on the Sonny and Cher show briefly. And uh, so as luck would have it, when we were at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium in Santa Monica with David doing the bread show, uh, Cher came to the show with one of her friends. And next thing we know, she came backstage after the show and hired both me and my brother to be in her band that she was going to do a Vegas review. And so we ended up doing that. I ended up doing it for three years. My brother did it for a year and a half. And then he, he didn't want to have anything else to do <laughs> with California at the time. So he went back to Texas and yeah. is still there to this day. And I stayed, I stayed, uh, as long as I could stand Las Vegas. And uh, I did it for about three years, you know, and then I joined Kansas. You know, I, I do, I had met some of the guys in Kansas when I was working with blood rock years earlier we did a couple of shows we had done some shows with grand funk railroad and we had done some shows with a lot of other bands edgar winter alice cooper um all kinds of people you know and uh and so then uh what was i saying we were th- thinking about um you're talking about share in the review yeah yeah share so i uh, after share i went with kansas for a couple of years yeah, I was I was looking at some of the video of them the other day, and it was amazing to hear all of the technicality and specialization that each one of those musicians had. Man, you had the guy that played really good violin. I mean, just yeah. great voices. I loved the the look of the show, how they spotlighted each individual, spaced out. It was really good looking, you know. Yeah, we did a big show in Omaha, and it was <clears throat> televised and recorded on uh, video and everything, and it's. Uh, it's one of the one that one of the ones that everybody watches when they want to know about the history of Kansas. <laughs> so, so where'd you go after Kansas then? So after Kansas, uh, they took a break, and uh, I needed work. I couldn't afford to take a break, so I heard that that Donna Summer was auditioning singers and players down in uh, North Hollywood. I mean, not North Hollywood in Hollywood, and I just drove down there and parked and went inside and they said who are you and i said well i'm so and so and i was recommended by so and so and they said well let's hear what you 
can do. So I sang a little bit and, uh, you know, went away thinking, ah, well, let's that, you know, whatever, you know, and I tried and, and then they call me, you know, so I ended up working with Donna on and off for years up until nearly the time that she passed away in 2012, you know, but a lot of this stuff that I was doing from this point going forward, uh, and I might mention that when I started with Donna, she, he just had a big hit with, uh, she works hard for the money. So she was kind of having a resurgence in her career, which was a good time to come aboard with her. Uh, and so, uh, but from this point in my career, from about 19, I want to say 1984 onward, I was, I was in and out with, with her and with other groups like Toto came next, then Amy Grant and then to the nineties. And we'll get on, we'll get into that as we go along. But, uh, I, I did work on and off with Donna until like 2012. Now, were you doing um, a lot of session work as well, or just pretty much touring? I did some session work, not a lot. I wasn't a top session guy in LA. Uh, I mostly touring. Yeah, mostly touring. As far as as far as your time with Donna, I mean, gosh, she was so iconic, and, and what a what a major loss uh, to the music industry. And and I mean, just absolutely. Tremendous performer. I, I mean, and, and I mean, hard for anybody to match or be better than what Donna Summer was. I mean, she was just so, so great. Her voice, her voice was just golden. She just had a golden voice. It really was. Now, did you get to sing with her, or were you just playing? I did. I did. A, I did a couple of duets with her, uh, but she did a lot of duets with a lot of pe- a lot of guys, and a lot of people. You know. And she did duets with with like uh, Barbara Streisand and and uh, some other people, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I did get to sing with her. Do you have any interesting stories you want to share about that experience with her, being on the road with her? And... Oh, I, I, you know, not really. Except that I had uh, my son was born around the time that her uh, sister's son was born, and so we had two little baby boys at the same time <laughs> and uh it, it, they hung out together it was really cool you know and uh you know we did it was very family oriented Fa- a lot of family came and she had a lot of donna had a huge family and they were always hanging around and it was it was a great time you know it was it was a large entourage but it was a, it was a good time yeah as far as uh after you left Donna, I mean, where where did it go after after that particular tour? After that, uh, I <clears throat> I heard that Toto was looking for a singer, and uh, I so I auditioned for them, you know, and I thought that I had nailed the the audition, but they ended up going with uh, Joe Williams, who okay. is their current singer to this day, and. Uh, then uh uh they called me anyway and said we'd still like to have you in the band because of every because of your versatility and what you do and your singing and everything you know so uh that that worked in that worked out to be a long-term relationship as well you know was now, jeff was, was percaro still with the group at that point yes yes he was and yeah. i ended up working with them for three four years and i did some solo stuff with luke uh and then I went back with Donna for a while, and uh, yeah, it was just it was just one of those things where when they they went off the road, they wanted to do another record, and we we're going to take a lot of time off, and I couldn't afford to at that point. I had a little I had little kids and a wife, a family to support, you know, and so I went back back with Donna, and I kind of bounced back and forth for a while, and did Donna for a while, and then. Then I, at the end of the 80s, I got a huge tour with Amy Grant. I mean, this was a really long tour of the U.S. And uh, I think we did some England dates and and stuff, too. But it was largely in the U.S. And it was a really long tour, very huge, big tours. One of the biggest tours that I had done up to that point, because she, she was playing a lot of, uh, you know, bit, bit larger venues. And Donna did some too, but lo- mainly, um, well, I don't know. I wouldn't say it would depend with Donna. Donna would do a lot of things like uh, in Vegas, 
shows and stuff like that. But but she would do big venues as well. But Amy was doing big arenas and and big huge festivals and stuff. Going back to Toto for a sec, I um, first of all I just love the group and and I always admired Percaro's drumming and well and his brothers all all the way around. They were all such a talented family. But you know uh, a friend of mine, Howard Steele who's a record producer, he and, and uh, Richard Perry had a studio in L.A. called Studio 55. I don't know if he ever did any work there. But uh, when we were out there playing, I'd gotten a phone call from Howard and asked if uh, my wife and I wanted to come and watch uh, Jeff lay down some drum tracks for Diana Ross's new album. And we said, heck yeah, you know, we'll be there. Give us an hour, you know, because we were driving in from Newport Beach. And... Uh, and wow, what a what a neat session that was, man! We were up in the control booth with with Howard and and uh, and and Richard, you know, and they just just to watch that that guy do his magic. I mean, he was he was amazing. I mean, I just at that point I wanted to put my sticks up and just go home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of drummers have had that same sentiment. Oh. Uh, yeah, Jeff was one of a kind, man. He just he was really something, you know, and. And what a what a great musician and a great guy. A bit terrible loss to the music community when he went. A he tremendous, passed. tremendous loss. We we saw Toto. My gosh, Warren, I guess it's been about I'm gonna say six or so years ago. They I don't know if you were on that tour or not, but they were with Yes. They were performing with Yes, traveling the country. Were you were you in El Paso think, on that? I think that was just before I came back with them. I came um, back with them in 2017, and now both now Luke and I had been doing Ringo since 2014, but yeah. we'll get into that later because we've got the whole 90s to still go through and and uh, the the and the, and what was going on that, at that time, you know. But like I said, I did a tour with Amy, a long tour with Amy, and. Um, then after that, I think I did some more dates with Donna. Another a few more, few more, another tour with Donna in the early '90s, and then, then I wanted to get off the road for a while. Well, you didn't you work some with Bill Medley as well? Yeah, that came later. That ah. came much. That came much later. Okay. Uh, yeah, the early '90s, I was kind of looking to get off the road. I don't know why. It was it was the, the best source of income that I had that worked for me. But I, I was trying to be more, stay at home more and be with my family more and everything. So I did a bunch of odd jobs, you know, mostly uh, courier work. Just, you know, I worked for Disney for a while, taking uh, film and packages around and so on and so forth. I drove a cab for a while. I worked with the handicap for a while. And then I finally decided that this wasn't the life for me. <laughs> that I needed to get back to work. And then then our good friend Robbie called me in the mid-90s and said, said, how would I like to audition for Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons? And I went, oh, yes, please. <laughs> sign and me up. <laughs> sign me up. And, uh, yeah, that was, I, that was a fun gig working with Frankie because we did lots of, you know, lots of vocals, you know, as you can imagine, lots of harmonies and, and uh, we even did a thing where we did kind of a barbershop thing, went out front, put down the instruments and went out and did a kind of a acapella uh, vocal thing with Frankie. And it was just a blast. You know, I did three or four years with him toward the end of the 90s. And then, um, you know, Frankie was going through some uh, personal things at that point. And uh, he wanted to take some time off. And again, so that was the same old story for me. <laughs> okay, you take some time off. I got to go look for some work, right? And mm -hmm. I had been sounded by uh, Olivia Newton-John's manager during the time that I was with Frankie. Uh, and it, it just happened to be toward the end of the time with that, that I was with Frankie. I didn't re realize it was the end of the time I was with Frankie. But he said, hey... Uh, what are you doing? Because he had been manager of Toto back in the 80s when, when I was with. So we had a connection there. Uh, and his name was Mark Hartley. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm I'm uh, working with Frankie. And she, he said, well, 
reason I'm calling, I got this gig with the, I think it'd be perfect for, uh, to do with, uh, Olivia, you know, and you could do the duet with her, the, the, uh, you could do the, uh, John Travolta bit with her on the grease part of the show, the grease medley part of the show. And I, and I thought, sure, that would be fun. I would love to do that. The only problem is, is right now I'm working with Frankie, you know? So I thought, I thought, well, there, there, that goes there, there goes that gig, you know, well, six months later, Frankie informed us that he wasn't going to work anymore for a while. And, uh, so that was that. And so I thought, man, so I hurried up and got on the phone and called my buddy. And I, and I said, is there any chance that that gig is still available? And he said, well, not right now, but maybe in six months. And, uh, so I think I called him back in six months and sure enough went in for the audition and got it and ended up working with Olivia from 2001 until right before the events of September 11th, 2001, uh, up until, uh, like 2015. Wow. On and off, on and off. And I mean, she had to take some time off because she had some health problems and when she would take some time off, I worked with that's when I worked with Bill Medley and I did some more dates with Donna. And so, like I said, all of these were kind of interspersed. It depend it depended on who was working and who and, you know, my availability and so on and so forth. So, you know, it was kind of just uh, I would kind of jumping around to different situations as they presented themselves and when when I could make it work, you know. What was it like to be front center stage with Olivia Newton John singing You're the One That I Want? I mean, that looked like so much fun for you, man. Man, that that was like, woo, you know, I, I couldn't believe it actually. You know, it's like, wow, man, I I never thought I'd be in this situation. And uh I'm sure a lot of guys wanted to be in my shoes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh you know, I just I didn't try to be John Travolta. You know, I try. I just did my, I did. I kind of put my uh, spin on it a little bit. You know, because you know, you kind of you kind of got to own it if you're going to be authentic. You know, that's the way I view it anyway. You know, not not try to do it completely different, but just just kind of be yourself and not you know not a clone of. I wasn't going to try to be a clone of John Travolta or anything like that. You know. How and, how hard was it to learn that routine? It wasn't hard, not the vocal part, you know. Vocally. No, I meant the dancing part. Well, the dancing, I'm not, you know, I'm not the dancer that John Travolta is, but I'm right. not, you know, I, I can move, you know. So it was just Olivia said, well, just do this and do this and we'll be okay, you know, and just relax. And so we just kind of did it, you know, and it worked for a long time, you know. And uh, I had a wonderful time on that gig with her. She was a very very sweet, generous lady. And, uh, I loved her very much. She's greatly missed mm-hmm. now, you know, cause you know, as you know, she passed away last year. She, uh, when we were traveling with my vocal groups on the road, I mean, some of her music is just still to this day. Uh, like I honestly love you. I mean, that was one that while we were traveling, she had just put out and it was just, um, uh, God, just all of her music was so incredibly good. You know, I mean, she just, she didn't do anything bad. It was all good. Oh, she was great. A wonderful vocalist, beautiful lady. Yeah. On the inside and the outside. I mean, she was just as beautiful on the inside as she was on the outside. And it was just an honor to work with her. You know, it's an honor to work with everybody I ever got the opportunity to work with, you know, and that's the way I look at it. And uh, so, like I said, I worked with her for 15 years of thereabout. Never had a chance to see her. It would have been uh, a thrill. But then that was during a time too where we were traveling some, and and uh, so you know, and that and that's the thing. As a traveling musician, you don't get to every once in a while you luck out on your day off on a Sunday or whatever, and get to go see the Guess Who or something, you know, and which was our case, and got to see several acts that way, you know, if they happen to be playing on a Sunday. But so after uh, after Olivia, what? What transpired after that 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 period? Well, during the time that I had Olivia, uh, 
she did take a significant amount of time off at one point because of her, uh, you know, she was struggling with cancer on and off for 20 some odd years, you know, right. Longer, I think. Uh, and, uh, it was getting harder for her. And, um, during, during one of those periods, I, I got a call from, uh, Steve Lukather and one just out of the blue, you know, and, uh, I had recon. I guess I had reconnected with Luke about a year earlier, just just to say hi and say, you know, let's go out and get lunch or something, you know, and and just catch up, you know. And that never materialized. Uh, and so I thought, well, I I understand he's busy and and uh, I'm busy, and and so if we don't, if we're not able to get together, uh, that's okay. And then one day out of the blue, he called me on a Sunday afternoon. And I had the family over and we were we were barbecuing and everything. And he he called me and said, hey, man, uh, <laughs> guess what? And I went, what? And he said, uh, I may have a gig for you. And I went, tell me, talk to me. And he said, well, uh, Mark Rivera is leaving Ringo to go with Billy Joel. And since you do the same thing that Mark does, would love to would love to have you do it and i don't think you're going to have to audition you're just they're just going to take my word for it yeah this is this is what he's telling me and i'm sitting here and i'm i'm like so stunned that i i like and i look over (laughs) all the stuff that i'm barbecuing is smoking and (laughs) oh wait a minute hold it and i had the, the smoke clear and everything and turned the thing off and this wait what did you say and so uh he said, do you want to do it? He said, yeah. I'm like, what do you mean do I want it? Of course I'm there, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I, I met Ringo in Canada. They flew me up to Canada. And um, I, I we did uh, we did some shows uh, there in Canada. And then we did a tour of the, of the East Coast. And it was... Uh, of course, Ringo, Todd Rundgren, Richard Page of Mr. Mister, Todd Rundgren, yeah. uh, Richard Page of Mr. Mister, of course, Luke and myself and Greg Raleigh okay. of Santana and right. Journey. And then myself and Greg Bissonette and, of course, Ringo, you know. And it's been that way since 2014 with a few changes. Richard Page is no longer with us. We, we did some shows with... Uh, with uh graham Goldman of mm-hmm. uh, 10 cc and you've got, you've got edgar winter in there right now too right now we have edgar winter uh and we do the double sax thing on frankenstein and and uh, all of the uh average white man stuff featuring hamish stewart who is now playing the bass no.
and uh, Colin Hay. So we started out with Todd and Richard on the left side of the stage, my left, and they're not there anymore, replaced by Colin Hay on the end and then Hamish Stewart next to him, then then uh, Luke and uh, Edgar Winter. Edgar Winter replaced uh, Greg Raleigh. And um, so are you are you going back and forth, you and Luke going back and forth, uh, doing the Toto and the Ringo's All Stars? How you doing? At the time, at the time, uh, at the beginning, I was still working with on some with Olivia, so I was going back and forth with her, you know. And I had to, get, I, I honestly, I had to get a sub for some of her gigs because I was doing the, the you know, the, the Ringo gig was much more lucrative and much more prestigious at that point in my career. And I, sure. I had to think about that, you know, and I had to make that decision and I gave him plenty of, it's not like I didn't, you know, anytime I had to work and move on to somebody else, I always tried to give my employers plenty of notice, you know, and everybody understands how the music business works, you know? Sure. One time I was asked to go out by Michael McDonald, uh, at and it, but it was literally at the last minute when I was working with Olivia, and I I said I can't do I can't bail on her at the last I can't I can't do that because, you know you got to give people time you know and notice you know, and that's what I did with her when I went went with, uh, with uh, Ringo and mm -hmm. we set it up for another guy to come in and and I you know went over my parts with him and taught him taught him what I do and. Uh, and so it, it worked out for a while for me to go back and forth. And then she didn't want to do that anymore. And I didn't blame her. And I was going to do, I was going to do Ringo exclusively anyway. And then, then Luke said, look, uh, we'd love to have you back with Toto, by the way. And I went, Oh, Oh, cool. And it, and that, that was working out because he was doing both. Yeah. Luke, Luke was doing both Toto and Ringo. So, so that would have been a natural for you just to, you know, go in tandem when he goes, you yep. know, and then just and so back it, and forth. And so it goes. That brings us up to that brings us up to the current time. Um and I've been working with Toto since 2017 and and Ringo and we're going back out and with Ringo and my that my next gig is with Ringo in uh September. September well, through October. And you you all recently did the room that the guitar player in my last group uh does all the entertainment for the Harris there in San Diego. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we played in Harris and we played in Vegas at the uh, Venetian. Yeah. And I think there may be some dates next year. I don't know. Toto wants to do a lot of stuff next year. They just, they just sent me an email with a whole bunch of dates for next year. And uh, so I, you know, I don't know. Uh, we'll have to, we'll have to see what what's what but uh but i'm available to do them and and uh and then i've got uh like i said ringo this the the rest of this year is just ringo starting i, I gotta tell you danny our uh my guitar player danny miller he uh he said working with ringo was just an absolute treat you know and he's got his favorites you know he's got foreigner playing out there a lot mm -hmm. uh, in his room and uh but but he absolutely loved working with Ringo. He was taking Ringo all around the property and everything and uh, showing him what was going on and all that. And he said, just such a charming guy, you know, yeah. just so much fun. Yeah, we had a blast there, too. That was, I think, uh, that's where we kicked off the last tour, you know. Yeah, I think you played the outdoor venue on that one. Oh, okay. So where am I? Uh, think, uh, I don't know. I get those kind of confused with... I think we were in Temecula, maybe. Yeah. Uh, for the first show, uh, trying to think of the outdoor gig. But anyway, yeah, I get well, them. Gonna, they, everything runs together after a while. They have, yeah, they have an indoor theater there, and then they have one that's out by the pool out back there. That that's much. Better. I remember that. Yes, yes, I remember that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice gig. Danny's been playing that or not playing it i mean he's played but he's uh he's been running in front of the house for quite a while but now he's he's more into the management side of it as well but he's yeah. a great guitar player he uh after we broke up back in 
77, seven, no, 78. Uh, he went to work for uh, Freddie Fender, and then after that, he was working with um, Spencer Davis. Spencer oh. Davis, man. Yeah, he became the lead guitarist for Spencer Davis and then, and then uh, Freddie Fender after that. But, mm -hmm. but anyway... Um, my brother did some work with Freddie Fender back in the day, back back in the mid seventies. You know, when I was telling you, I had the Ham Brothers, and we were playing the Texas Circuit, and did a lot of stuff down in Houston. He was he he was doing a lot of recording with uh, Freddie Fender. You know? Nice. And when we played at Gillies and opened up for, uh, we opened up for uh, Leon. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up um, how you met your wife, Ava. You know, you want to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so that's back in the day of share. That's back in yeah. the early '80s, before I was with Kansas, and the three years that I was with uh, uh, Share in Las Vegas, and uh, she came to one of the shows with her mom and her girlfriend, who they called her sister because they looked they looked alike, they dressed alike, and uh, they, were, they weren't really sisters, but uh, but they came to the show and then. And uh, I guess when I was leaving backstage, I just ran into him. And, and Ava's mom, my wife's mom, my future mother-in-law said, here, meet my daughters. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I thought that they were sisters. You know, I guess it was easier for her to say, here's my daughters, you know, than, than, than try to introduce everybody. And so but it was it was brief, you know, and uh, that was a brief encounter. Um I, the second time I ran into Ava was at the baked potato. Uh, not long after that, I just went there to see Dean play with uh, Koinonia and uh, those guys. Great band. I love that band. And uh, she was there. And I, I played her uh, some of my music in the car afterwards. And then and then that was that. I didn't really see her anymore after that. Um, and th then another time she... Uh, it was after I went to South Africa with with Cher. Uh, we we played Sun City before it wasn't cool to play Sun City. You know? <laughs> and they wrote that big song and said, "Don't not, not going to play Sun City." You remember remember right, that one, right? Uh, and so when I came back from South America, we were back at Caesar's Palace, and I'm walking backstage, and one of the stagehands goes. Telephone call for Warren Ham. Is Warren Ham around here? And I'm like, who's calling me backstage at Caesar's Palace? Right. And so I went, I went over there and answered the phone and and it was Ava. She says, Do you remember me? And I went, not not really. And <laughs> oh, God. I could because I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't put the name to the face at the time. Right. And uh, anyway, we ended up having dinner together and and uh I took her back to her ho her hotel and she was staying there and her brother was there and they, they had to kind of all come to Vegas together and everything. And it was all very polite and above board and everything like that. And, and then when I got back to LA, I realized she only lived a couple of bo blocks from me in LA. And uh, cause we exchanged numbers at that point and she invited me over for dinner. And uh, when I went, I literally walked over there from from where I was staying. I was living in uh, Studio City with some friends at that point, and uh, then I went went over there and we we started dating. And then not too long after that, we got engaged and got married. And then I moved into her little apartment that she had there. And then then we uh, got a house. We rented a house out in. Uh, in Reseda for a while and then then we finally found our house here in Northridge and we're still here in the early 90s just in time for the Northridge earthquake and we were, uh, we were there right yeah. before it yeah yeah man how this little house held up really good it's it's built on a concrete slab I guess the guy that built it was a cement contractor or something like that and yeah and, uh, and the house held up really well you mentioned a moment ago the baked potato. There's a, a friend of mine in El Paso by the name of Bernie Mora who had a band called Tangent. Mm -hmm. In fact, Lee Thornburg played in that group, played trumpet in the group. And uh, another L.A. player, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, seemed like it was Doug something. I can't remember. Great bone player. 
and then the other sax players were from El Paso when they when they put that group together to go out and do a, a show. It was strictly an instrumental group, but really uh, really strong, really funk rock, real good stuff. And uh, they played the baked potato a couple times in the last four or so years. The drummer since has passed, and uh, but boy, they were really a, a hot group. Uh, did you ever go into the Charlie Browns in Huntington Beach? No, I did, I did not. I played the, at the Golden Bear in yep. Huntington with I did that with uh, AD, which you I know. didn't tell you about. AD was a a Christian rock band that was post that I was in with uh, Carrie Livgren and Dave Hope from Kansas because oh, they wow. wanted to break away from Kansas and do more of a of a Christian progressive rock thing uh, that was really an offshoot of of Kansas. It never really got off the ground to speak of uh, in terms of, I mean, we we did a couple of great records. I did a couple of really great records that I'm proud of with those guys. And I'm singing lead on several of the tracks. And there was another another singer, there were two singers in the band. And it was it was right in the heyday of the 80s with all of the all of the the uh, you know uh, Thomas Dolby's and the the uh, uh, Sting, I mean uh, uh, the Police and the Howard Joneses and uh, 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 you know uh, all of those Duran Duran and all those eighties bands, you know. So yeah. we were kind of in that mold, you know, and doing the, doing a semi kind of a Kansas thing too, and it was really a good band, but we just it didn't ever work out. You know how bands are, how how you go through. You know. Oh yeah, we. Uh, I, you just reminded me of another when you said Golden Bear. We played a room called the Golden Pheasant, which was right across the street from Disneyland in Anaheim, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a nice little showroom. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it would have been in 1973, and we're we're doing this part in the show of uh, our girl singer singing. I don't know how to love him from Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm -hmm. And you could hear a pin drop. I mean, the audience is just glued to her. We've got a pin spot on her with big B3 sound behind her and me on timpani sound. And it was, um, it was really cool. And then all of a sudden we hear all this commotion and we're going, my gosh, who, who, how rude can you be? And it's three streakers coming through, <laughs> through the showroom. It was two two girls and a guy, stark naked, running through the showroom, and they went, they are heading for the exit door, and we're going, okay, well, uh, so much for the <laughs> end of this show. We took our break and said we'll be back shortly, everybody, and uh, and that was that. But that uh, that was a thing. That was a thing for a while, wasn't it? The that street? was a thing out there, man, and we experienced it firsthand. <laughs> Uh, not exactly the way I would have pictured it to happen, but you know, hey, it did. So, <laughs> what a, what are those crazy moments, you know? But uh, yeah. a lot of a lot of crazy stuff. Before we wrap this thing up, Warren, I want to, um, I want to first thank you, you know, for agreeing to do this show with me. It's it's really fun to hear your your success and and how it came about and what all you've done. You're a, you're an incredible musician, and I just and wanted to tell you that, man. You're, you're it's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking with you and, and reminiscing a little bit. It's always good to to look back and do that. I have to bring up one more subject here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna end this show with a video that I saw 11 years ago, and it was you and Rachel Talbot, your daughter, yeah, doing one of my most favorite duets uh in fact when i heard when i first heard this i think andre andre buccelli was doing it i don't remember who he was doing it with it was celine dion celine dion and yeah. and, it, and it just ripped me apart man i just thought man it doesn't get any better than that well i gotta say it gets very close <laughs> when i watch you guys Thank you. You guys are were, were tremendous together, and 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 hence the 
the saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I, I can definitely see that. The, the gene definitely went to your daughter from you. And well, she's in Nashville now, and she's carving her own. She's carving her own career out. So I'm looking forward to seeing what she's going to do in the future. Well, you know, you might, when you talk to her next time, you might tell her about me, and, and I'd be glad to visit with her and talk about what she's been doing and, you know, any way I can help promote her uh, with my show. I, I'm always looking for new talent, man, and, and, and she is a phenomenal, you know, singer as well. So Thank you. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. And, uh, well, in closing, Warren, I just want to say thank you once again, and thank you, Robbie, for making this happen, my buddy. And uh, uh, next time you talk to Luke, you know, Luke, man, tell him that uh, I'm still waiting on him to return my phone call. I want to do an interview with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> okay, right, man. Take Thanks, care, man. man. Peace Had a lot love. of fun. Thank you, man. Loved it. God bless. Bye.
Send all catches sound.